this morning we're going to preach a message that I titled First Things First. And so I'm just going to put the title up here. First Things First. Okay? And we're going to come out of two different uh, passages in the scripture. One's going to be out of Isaiah 55. That's actually what we're going to read first. Isaiah 55. And then we're going to come back over here to Judges chapter 6 to finish it up. And one of the things that I was going to say is, is that just to kind of give us a timeline of where, of where, we, where we are in all of this, you know, the exodus where the children of Israel left Egypt was somewhere around 1450 B.C. I like to know where I am in the Bible. I don't know about you because it, li it lends to context. Oh, by the way, uh, we haven't made any final decisions yet, but I see Robert kind of standing out there in the hallway. After that last shooting thing that happened, you know, I think Robert's real real aware of all that. So we haven't gotten to the point yet where we're going to have like a, uh, uh, haven't done it yet, but I think one day maybe we'll have a camera out there, some kind of little doorbell thing that like lights up in the back and if you show up late you know they'll be able to see you and you'll be able to ring the little doorbell but I told him that uh, that we probably need to leave somebody out there Amen. to wait until say like 10 15 uh, 10 20 or you know maybe not that late but 9 45 9 50 9 55 something like that for, for people that show up late yeah to greet them but then to also let them in so that we don't have to like, because it's kind of weird, dude, like you're locking your church, you know? We, I mean, really, I, 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 I kind of have mixed emotions. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But at the same time, things are getting crazy out there. And, you know, I think that some of this is the devil just trying to prevent people from wanting to come to church, yeah. Yeah. you know? And uh, I don't know of a better place that we could die, but at the same time, you know, there ain't nobody really looking to die today. I don't know. So, but anyway, we're going to try to try to keep it to where we're not going overboard, right? Living in fear, but at the same time trying to be aware and protect. And, protect. and the more that we're aware of it, uh, you know, the easier it'll be, you know, but we always want to be mindful of guests and stuff like that, all right? I just want you to know that we're thinking about it. Um, maybe you are for God, but we're thinking about it. Okay. Judges chapter 6. This was Exodus, about 1450 B.C., Judges, somewhere around 1400 to, you know, somewhere around 1100 B.C. So you see this is about a 400-year period between these two time frames. This is about 700 B.C. right here. And then I would say that, you know, the next spot I'm going to show is the cross, uh, which is, uh, you know, when we start A.D., right? About, I mean, okay, let me just be, let me just be real. This is a cloud. That's heaven. And we're saying that that's light. Light came from heaven. That would be the birth of the Lord. This is the cross right here where he died. And so that starts the church age. Right? And then at the end of the church age would be the rapture and then the, the millennial reign of Christ. Y'all heard of that before, right? The millennial reign. Amen. That means that Jesus is coming back to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. The reason that I'm saying that I even put that up here is because a lot of what's being spoken of in Isaiah 55, which is where we're going to start reading, to some extent is connected to talking about the millennial reign. So we're going to start reading Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 11. Now, before, real quick, too, before we get there, just so that you understand a little bit about what's going on in this time frame. From, from this time here, when you end the Judges, you get your first king in the book of Judges. The people scream, we want a king. And God, like he does with all of us, he, people have preached this before. God has a permissive will and a perfect will. I don't know that I completely agree with that. What, I, what it is, is, is that if you demand to get what you want, then God will let you get what you want. But I, I don't know that he's, he's not okay with that. You understand what I'm saying? It's not that he will never work within your life, even though you demanded what you wanted. It's not that he can never turn bad situations into good situations because that's what God does. 
But ultimately, God had a perfect will for his people Israel, and it was that he was preparing a shepherd boy named David in the field to teach him how to care for the sheep so that he would be able to properly care for his people Israel whenever he got to the allotted time frame. Okay, I, have a, I can prove that from the scriptures that Saul was never God's intent, but that instead it was David, but we don't really have time to get into all of that. Right here today. Nevertheless, the people demand that we want a king. And there's many times in our lives that we demand that we want a particular thing and God allows it to happen. But the result there of, of our desire doesn't turn out to be a blessing, but instead sometimes it turns out to be a curse. Okay, And that's essentially what happened in Israel's life before it was all said and done. Some, some bad things happened to the nation of Israel um, because, see, after Saul came David, those were the good times. But then David's son Solomon, if you'll remember, David's son Solomon made altars to false gods. Now, listen. What we're going to read today is that Israel was worshiping false gods here. Israel was worshiping false gods here. This is like a connection of God's people going back into the world. Okay? Whenever, for the New Testament Christian today, whenever we connect our, ourselves to things in the world, things that maybe were from our past, whatever they may be, that pull us away and separate us from the presence of the Lord, when you read Old Testament Israel and they connected themselves to the false gods of the world, essentially you could say that's the same thing that the New Testament Christian does when he reconnects himself to the things that the world previously offered him. Okay? And he goes back to those things. Well, after Solomon's fall, if you'll remember the story, Solomon, what did he do? He built altars to false gods. Y'all remember that? He took all them wives and he let those women influence him to build altars to the gods that they served. That's why God always warned Israel's people not to intermarry with women that did not believe the way that they believed because ultimately what he said was they're going to cause you to go, well, this is how God says it in the King James Version anyway, a whoring after their gods. And you're going to, they're going to get you to go to their sacrifices and they're going to get you to worship their false gods. That's why true believers should never really marry or be connected closely to an unbeliever, at least not on the front end. It's different if you married somebody beforehand and then you got saved after. But once you're a Christian, I don't mean to be rude, but it's, it's foolishness. If you truly are sold out to the Lord and you believe that the Bible is the word of God and you believe that you desire to live your life according to that Bible, it's complete foolishness for you to go back and to connect yourself to a person of the world that doesn't believe the way you do, doesn't believe the word of God the way that you do. It doesn't mean that if you're saved and your spouse isn't saved that he can't get saved. That's not true or she can't get saved. But you get the point that I'm trying to make. You shouldn't be unequally yoked. Well, Solomon connected himself to those women. I'm giving you a history lesson right now. Okay, Solomon connected himself to those women and they said, oh baby, make me an altar for Baal. Make me an altar for Ashtoreth. Make me an altar for Molech. I've got to go serve my God. I want to offer him up some sacrifices. Well, the problem is, make me an altar for Chemosh. The problem is, is Chemosh and Molech required child sacrifice. That's how bad this situation was. This is pure Satanism, okay? We don't have time to get into it all that deep. But what ended up happening is, is because of Solomon's failure against God, I don't know if you can see this, there was a split in the kingdom. I just drew a line between right there in the middle of the Jordan uh, River that separated the north from the south. And there was a split in the kingdom, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And God began to bring prophets to warn Stating because of their, their, their rebellion, because of their refusal to serve him, that there was going to be enemies that come from the north over here. This is where the Tigris and the Euphrates are. This is where I'm going somewhere. I'm just building it up for you a little bit. Okay, just bear with me. Southern Iraq now, it used to be called Babylon. Assyria was up here. Okay. Northern kingdoms compared to where they were were going to come in and bring bondage. God warned it. By the time we read Isaiah, Assyria has already taken the northern part of the kingdom. They're already in bondage. These people over here are already in bondage. But the prophet's warning the southern kingdom that Babylon's about to come. Because see, the southern part of the kingdom, who were supposedly the devoted ones, 
It'd be kind of like if you said, oh, well, our church, we're really good compared to other churches. Well, guess what? No, you're not, you're not as righteous as what you think you are. And if you don't get yourself right, you're going to find yourself in the same bondage as the church down the street, right? Uh, that's what it was. Judah, the lower portion, oh, we just, we the righteous ones. Well, guess what? No, your life's not right. You're following after your big brother up at, that, was a, that was above you, and you're about to find yourself in bondage too, right? So Isaiah's warning. But at the same time, in the warning, there's always a word of promise right. because God's a good God. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's kind. And even though you may go the wrong way and even though you might find yourself back in failure, back in back in bondage, God will deliver you. Amen. And he promises to deliver his people that will turn their hearts and their eyes towards him. And so that's partially of what we're reading here. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 through 11. He said, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that has no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me. That word hearken means to not just listen with your ears, but to submit to the word that's spoken. Hearken diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me and hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him a witness to the people. Now that word wit that word him there. That, that personal pronoun, because it mentioned David. It talked about the sure mercies of David, but it says, I have given him. That's talking about Messiah right there. Okay? The sure mercies of David, God gave a promise to King David. And the promise that he gave to King David was that through him, Messiah would come. Now, we've already done a lot of teaching on the front end in this church to explain who Messiah is, but every now and then we get new people in there. We need to be reminded that the word Messiah, it also means Christ in the Greek. This is Hebrew. And what does it mean? Anointed one. Anointed one. Anointed one. God's promising his people Israel for thousands of years that he was sending him. That's the beauty of the Bible. That's the beauty of the Old Testament. Don't walk up and go, oh man, he bores me. He's talking about the Old Testament. No, we're going to unfold Jesus from out of the Old Testament, written 2,000, 4,000 years, 2,000 years before Jesus ever showed up on the face of the earth. And what we're going to do is we're going to unfold him from the Old Testament scriptures. And we're going to find out that the God that you serve has been having this plan in place for thousands of years of human history. The problem is, is that we've been blinded to it. The world's been blinded to it. They don't want to turn to the scriptures. So don't know. The problem that we have is, is that people don't want to study the Old Testament and take the time to find Jesus in the midst of it. Amen. But it's like a treasure Amen. for someone that's looking for a treasure. Amen. 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 Jesus is a treasure. Amen. He says, I've given him for a witness to the people. He's given him Messiah. He's given the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one that he said was coming. He came. Light came from heaven to this earth. He says, a leader, a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. That's talking about foreigners. People from other places. You know, the book of Revelation says he's made kings and priests from every tribe, nation, and tongue. God's plan for salvation always included the entirety of the earth. Yes. Amen. Some people sit back and say, well, I just don't even know what a Gentile is. Well, the problem with that is, is that we don't understand the history of the Bible. We have a difficult time interpreting the scriptures. God made a people for himself named Israel. But every other nation, every other person around the globe was known as a Gentile. They didn't know God. They only knew false gods. That's kind of like you growing up making it real for you growing up in a home where they didn't practice Christianity, where you didn't learn the word of God. All you did was know the things of the world. Like if your mom and daddy owned a bar and you grew up in that culture. I mean, I'm not picking on people that if your mom and daddy owned a bar. I'm just trying to make a point. You, that's what you knew. You knew the world. You didn't know the scripture. You didn't know God. Right. But God wants everybody saved. His plan was always that everyone would come to the Lord. Amen. It says, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord your God. And for the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. 
Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. There's a day when it's going to run out. We know that, right? There's a day when the grace of God will run out. People nowadays, the music in the church is all about love. And it's all about, and Robert sent me a, a text the other day. <laughs> talking about that Hillsongs group in New York and that pastor over there. And I'm like, well, thank God we don't play none of their stuff. We might play some old Hillsongs from Australia that talk about Jesus and the sacrifice, but we ain't playing all that. Other. And I always felt weird about all that stuff anyway, Oceans Deep and all this flowery language that talks about love that's not connected to a sacrifice. The love of God is revealed through the, the, the shedding of his son, his only begotten son's blood. That's how God reveals his love. If you can't, you can't get to the father unless you go through the son. Because there's a sin that separates. There's a sin problem that separates sinful man from a holy God. He's got a way to get rid of that sin. He's got a way to remove that barrier. He's not going to change his mind. That's the plan. And unless you go through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and faith in that and receive the righteousness of the lamb for your own life, you can't have real relationship with God. That's right. But yet the modern church doesn't want to hear that because now you're offending people. You're making them squirm in their seats. Hold on a second. Everybody ought to be squirming. That's it. We all, if we believe that it's real, then we all ought to be reverent towards the word of the Lord and towards the will of God. Right? Amen. But one day it's going to run out. He said, he said, call upon him while he's near. He's near right now. His voice, he can hear you. Amen. But there's coming a day when mercy runs out. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. It doesn't matter how far away you are, how deep you've gone, how long you've been away. <laughs> That's the good thing about God, man. That's the story of the prodigal son right there. I mean, it just popped in my head right there. The story of the prodigal son. He took everything that it was rightfully his. He took it and he just squandered it and he threw it away. He didn't even think that his daddy wouldn't want him anymore. But when he comes, his daddy's been waiting for him the whole time. And that's the Lord. He's just waiting for us to get right with him. Amen? Yeah. He says right here, um, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. You know what? Sometimes it just it's real difficult to live for the Lord, <laughs> like just daily to walk with the Lord. I'm not talking about the fact that you don't go back to the to the brothel anymore. <laughs> Whether he ever went there, but what does that word even mean? Well, you don't, care. You don't need to know that. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that you still hang out. At, I used to go to this bar called Shanahan's and laugh at. I'm sure that things changed names by now, but maybe not. It, it doesn't mean that you're going back to all of those old places necessarily anymore. I'm just saying to live for the Lord, to have the wisdom of God, the understanding of God with our minds, the way that it was previously enculturated and taught by our previous way of life to understand the love of God and the revelation of God and the wisdom of God in minute circumstances each and every day that you live. Yeah. When people treat you wrong, yeah. when people talk to you wrong, when people beat you down, <laughs> when, when, when people don't respect you, you understand what I'm saying? Even if you handle the situation right then and there the right way, and you don't give them a what for. And I'm not talking about physically. Hopefully you, we've gotten past that. But but even still, let's just, but but you didn't even, you didn't even cuss them out. <laughs> That's a good thing. Or you didn't even raise your voice and holler at them. Man, you're making progress. But guess what? Now, see, a lot of times the Lord will just shut my mouth straight up. Like I'm telling you, sometimes I won't even catch on till like 20 minutes later. I'm driving down the road. It ain't like I'm dumb. I'm pretty sharp sometimes. And I'm driving down the road. I'm like, that person just did, yeah. just yeah. just <laughs> said something to me that was like talking me. And I didn't even. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. But now I got it. Now the enemy's like, yeah, you see what they think about you. At, right? You see what I'm getting at? God says my ways are above your ways. Yeah. Yeah, you can't think like me. You, 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 until you learn my word and have a relationship with my presence and my spirit is in you and you learn of me and walk with me, you don't even have a clue of my ways. My thoughts are so far above your thoughts. Yeah. See, because I'm forgiving people that do me dirty. Amen. People that sin against me, I planned this whole thing in advance to send my son. That while we were yet sinners, Amen. he died for us. Amen. So I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know who's done you dirty. 
But the enemy wants to try to put bitterness in your heart. Listen to me. This is good for the school age kid all the way to the grandparent. Because they got people, kids on the playground that clown all day long. And we act like it's all fun. But let me tell you something. You get clowned enough and it'll hurt your heart. You dog somebody enough and it will hurt your heart. It'll get deep down on the inside of you and it'll cause anger problems and it'll cause, listen, I'm not all about psychology. It can't fix nothing. It's just a band-aid. But let me tell you, you can ruin somebody's psyche by constantly talking down to them and cursing them instead of, amen, amen speaking. To, gee, God speaks words of life. He, war he warns. He warns, but he speaks words of life. He's here to lift up. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Amen. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. But look, this is the good part. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither. What does that mean? The rain and the snow come down, but they don't go back up. Okay? He says, and make it. He says, but instead it waters the earth and makes it, the earth, bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. You see, almost like, well, I don't mean to get Lion King on you, but the circle of life. You got water coming down, and then you got seed sprouting, turning into grain, ground up, turned into bread, and then the eater gets to eat. And you see, all of, the guy says, I got all this in control. But just as all that happens, he says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. God says his word, the word void is another way to say empty. God says my word is not going to turn out to be empty. God says my word is going to accomplish what I say it's going to accomplish. It may not happen in the time that you expect it to happen. It might not do it the way that you expected it to look like. But my word will accomplish what I have sent my word to accomplish. Yes. Amen. So in this passage of scripture, God proclaims the fact that his word will not return to him void. And within the passage that we just read, he explained already what many of his intended purposes are. So real quick, we're just going to look. Number one, point number one of this part anyway, is that he has water. We're talking about doing first things first, but i got to be honest with you, first things first don't come to the end in this message, okay? Point number one about what we just read is that God has water. He said, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. I need you to know that people are dehydrated inwardly. I'm not trying to get all counseling psychological on you, but I'm trying to say people are dehydrated inwardly. Just as you need physical water in order for all your physiological and chemical processes to take place in your physical body, we also need spiritual hydration for our inner man. Listen, the soul and the spirit of man make up the inner man. And one day, that inner man that's cased in this decaying house, that's what Paul called it. He said it was a house. He said one day this house, this temporary house, is going to dissolve. This natural body that we live in is going to die and it's going to decay. And hallelujah, one day we're going to get a glorified body. But the point is, is this, that there's something inwardly on the inside of us, the spirit and soul of this man that makes up the inner man that's going to live for an eternity. That's the part of man that's either alive to God or dead to God. And listen, I'm not trying to get all technical, but the soul of man is made up partially of his mind. It's made up of his mind. It's connected to his will. It's connected to his emotions. As you've gone through life, things have happened to you. Pain uh, has occurred. Circumstances have occurred. And it causes a dehydration. It causes a drought on the inside. And we get hungry and we get thirsty. And people are driven by their thirst to try to quench it. They, they, they're moving towards and they're looking for some kind of a physical drink of water to fix what goes on on the inside. And this doesn't just affect the world on the outside. This affects people in the right, church. Right. You think just because you got saved, all your problems were fixed? Oh, listen, <clears throat> one of the things that I, that, that I realized in my own walk with the Lord was once the Lord finally delivered me from the bondage of drugs and alcohol, now there was all kind of major issues on the inside of me that had to be dealt with. Personality flaws that he's still dealing with. He had, now he can finally make a connection to the real life. 
He, Matt was hiding all of those problems and pain from his past by doing all of those other things that he was doing. Once all that stuff was removed and you're no longer numb in the pain with all of that, now you have to face the reality of who you are. And you're either going to let the Lord in to, to minister and heal or you're going to be in a world of hurt. That's right. We see this story out of John 4. I've preached this many times with the Samaritan woman. This is just one example of thirsty people. John 4, John 4 13 through 17. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. You remember the story? Jesus' disciples went off to get some food. Jesus is at the well of Jacob. And here's this Samaritan woman. And there's a long discourse between him and this one woman. And I'm not going through the whole story again right now. But the point is, is this, is that Jesus asked for a drink of water from her. And she says, well, why would you even ask for a drink of water from me, a Samaritan woman? There's a lot behind that. We, can't, we don't really have time to get into it. But Jesus talks about the fact that he says whoever drinks this water, this physical water that you've come out here to draw up out of this well is going to be thirsty again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst because Jesus is talking about spiritual water. He's talking about something that's going to provide a, a, a hydration to our spirit man. Amen. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman says unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Jesus says unto her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, You have well said, I have no husband. Now, he goes on to tell her that's because you've had five before. And the one that you're with now is not your husband. So he said, Yeah, you told the truth, but you didn't tell the whole truth. What it was is it showed a pattern in her life. It showed a pattern that she was thirsty, but she was trying to fill her thirst with something physical. It doesn't necessarily mean that you had a bunch of husbands or a bunch of wives in here this morning. It doesn't even necessarily mean that the situation has been related. Maybe that is your story. I didn't know who was showing up this morning. I might have known a few of y'all were going to be here, but I didn't know everybody. This is what the Lord put on the paper. Maybe it is that. Okay, but maybe it's not that. But whatever it is that you've been trying to fill yourself up with in a physical sense to try to fix a spiritual problem, it's left you empty each and every time. Amen. Is the point. Amen. And you can keep on searching and That's keep it. on drinking, but it's going to keep on leaving you empty and you're still going to be thirsty. That's right. If we're all honest, we can see episodes of this in our own lives. It may not be, like I said, the relationships or whatever, but Lord knows I can list off all kinds of stuff. That's right. And some of them affect me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Still, you still got it. That's the this truth. Creature? Yeah, man. Of course I still got it. It ain't all filled up. I'm a human being. Sometimes I think I'm getting over this one, though. I was, lately, I've been trying to spend money. Like, that's going to fix it. Oh, Lord. Clothes or something like that. Clothes ain't fixing nothing, man. I'm tired of buying clothes. I'm tired of spending money, all right? I want to start saving money, uh, you know? I'm just being honest with you. That's just one thing. Thank God it ain't snorting coke. Uh, I mean, you know, thank God it's not something like that. Praise God. Lord, give me your grace. Give me your strength, you know? But I don't want nothing. I don't want to be in bondage to nothing. Lord, set us free. Amen? The point number two, people are constantly looking for satisfaction somewhere other than God. I know that's kind of similar to what I just said, but he said right here, you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfies not. Usually bread is a food that will stick to your ribs, right? I mean, I don't eat much carbs lately. I'm not trying to act like I'm a rice spiritually because I don't eat carbs. But what I'm trying to say is when I eat, I can eat protein, I can eat avocados, but I'm telling you, I still feel like I'm hungry after if I eat a loaf of French bread, dude, I'm good for a while. I might pass out in a coma for a little bit, but I feel good, satisfied, right? Usually bread is something that will stick to your ribs. The Lord said, you're looking for bread that's not going to satisfy. It's not keeping you full. The people are spiritually speaking looking for one loaf after another. And, you know, I just wrote down in here because I knew that this was similar to the first one. What was, what was the bread you were looking for? You know, that's for us to be introspective in our own lives, to look in our own lives. 
What is it that I used to look for in bread? What was my bread before? What was my water before? What, what is it even today? Is this still affecting my life today? It might not be the same exact things, but what is it today that's affecting my life that I'm trying to look at to bring fulfillment in my life today? Amen? Amen. Point number three of this passage we started with is, is that God has a plan to put an end to the search. Amen? He said right here, I have given him for a witness to the people. God said he gave us Messiah. He was telling Israel at that time, even in the midst of their dry and barrenness, because they've been unfaithful to the Lord, that he has given Messiah, prophetically speaking, he's not coming for another 700 years. But he said, I've given him. It's already done. My word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which it is set forth to do. Messiah will show up and I have given him. Amen. To be a witness. For the people. God promised that he would give Messiah. And that through him other nations. Other people would come. When, for you and I. What does it mean by nations? It means the people that you work with. It means the people that you go to school with. It means the people that you. Wherever you go. Wherever you hang out. Those people. They're the other nations. Because they're the people that don't know the Lord. But God wants everybody saved. Amen. Amen. Matthew 21, 43. This is just like an example of a fulfillment of that particular scripture. Jesus says, he says to the Pharisees, which were the religious leaders of the day when he was alive for Israel. He says, therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. What does that mean? Well, it's a, it's a fulfillment in two different ways. Number one, it fulfills. What God said in Isaiah about the fact that I have given him for a witness to the people talking about other nations coming to him because ultimately that resulted in Gentiles, people that weren't Jews, coming to the Lord. But it also was, was a, the problem was the Pharisees were the leaders of Israel at the time, but they refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, their leadership was taken out of the way. Their use by God was taken out of the way, and he used them no more. He's no longer using the nation of Israel as his people. Now, if you're a Jew and you're saved, yes, but not just because you're a Jew. If you've rejected Jesus as Messiah, then you're not his people. Period. Amen. And, and ultimately, he's not done with Israel because one day he will set his Jesus's throne will be in Jerusalem. Amen. But this is a partial fulfillment. God promised them that he gave Messiah. Amen. And while this passage describes a fulfillment of other nations coming, it also speaks of the Gentiles who would be saved through the gospel after the cross. It describes the fact that people who represented God weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Now, that's an important part. I'm glad I stopped and read that because I'm saying a whole lot this morning. But that's an important part. It shows that even back then, God, many of God's people weren't doing what they were supposed to do. The religious leaders rejected Jesus. Therefore, the gospel was entrusted to believers in the new covenant. In the Isaiah passage, he was promising Old Testament Israel that he would give the Messiah who would be a witness to him, to the Father. Jesus came and gave testimony to what he knew and had seen about the Father. Look at John chapter 1 verse 18 real quick. It says, John bear witness in verse 15. John bear witness of him. That's talking about John the Baptist right there. Yeah. And Christ, John, the, John the Beloved is writing John and he explains, he introduces John the Baptist. He says, John bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spoke. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests. So really and truly that was. Miss Annette was right. That was John the Beloved. He's writing about John. He introduces John the Baptist. But then what he says in verse 18. This is John the Beloved who says. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father. He has declared him. What this is talking about. This bosom. Part of the idea has the idea really of a child with its mother. You can imagine the closeness 
of a child with its mother, but it's even closer than that. Because it's talking about the inside of the bosom. It's talking about the heart. It's talking about the, the oneness of Jesus the Son and God the Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And there's nobody that's seen God like that. Even Moses, who the Bible says that God's presence would show up and talk to him in the tent. <clears throat> Moses didn't know the Father the way because Jesus and the Father are one. Amen? Amen. And Jesus came to declare him. Now, what I like about that word declare right there, and I'm not trying to get too technical. I'm not going to write the whole Greek word out. But the, you know how I told you before that Greek words are built on, prep, on, on, on compound words. That's a preposition in the Greek. And what it means is out. <coughs> that word declare describes out. There's a big word that we use in Bible study called exegesis. Maybe you've heard people talk about that before. What, what exegesis means, it means to pull out of the scripture. Eisegesis means to see into the scripture. You don't want to eisegete the scripture. You want to exegete the scripture. When you eisegete the scripture, it means you take all of what you think and you put it in there. When you exegete the scripture, you try to come to the passage of scripture and allow the word of God to speak. See, we got a problem a lot of times. Preachers have a lot of problem a lot of times where they want to take all the information that they know and they want to place it in the book instead right. of letting the book place what's in yeah. it into them. All right. But anyway, this word declare has that preposition ek, which means out to tell, to bring or to lead out. This is what I like about it. It means to unfold, reveal or to make known as a teacher. Jesus' life as Messiah, the anointed one, came to this earth to unfold the Father. What he looked like, his character, who he was, his love. Jesus came to reveal. He did it. Amen. amen. He did it. He came to reveal what the Father looked like. We have the testimony of Jesus' life in the Word of God. We see all of these passages of Scripture coming together to get a revelation of the Father's love, to get a revelation of what God looked Looks like. He came to reveal. That's what he, that's what the father said. I'm talking about the Isaiah passage. I gave him to be a witness to the people. People are hungry. People are thirsty. They're dying of dehydration. They need a revelation to know who the one it is that gives living water. Who the one it is that is the manna from heaven. Amen. And if they don't ever get a hold of it, they're going to always be thirsty. And they're going to always be hungry. Because if they don't get a hold of Jesus, there's that spot. He came to reveal the Father, and in his revelation, it was revealed that he had the bread and water we were looking for, and that it was all free through faith. Hmm. That, that's what it said in the Isaiah passage, if you'll remember. He said, oh, you that are thirsty, why do you buy bread that's not even bread, and that's not satisfying you? Come, drink freely. Come, eat. It's not going to cost you anything. You know why? Because the gospel's free. Amen. Listen to me. It's free to you and me. Now, it cost Jesus his life. Right. It cost the Father the most precious thing that heaven ever held. That's right. Amen. But for you and I, it's free. You can't sell this gospel message. Hallelujah. It says right here that in, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 16. We're going to look at verse 16 first, then we're going to look at verse 17. I'm talking about freedom. I'm talking about the gift is free. Amen. That's it. That's right. The water is free. The bread is free. It says in Romans 5, 16, it says, and not as it was by one that sinned. Talking about Adam. The one sin of Adam. The gift is not like Adam's sin. Adam's sin caused everybody to be guilty. You know that, right? You know that you're a sinner because you were born of Adam. You're part of Adam's fallen race. Right. Adam is the fountainhead of all humanity. Each and every human being that's ever walked the face of the earth came from Adam. Right? But that's why you had to be born again. You were born again, amen, of incorruptible seed, amen. born of Jesus. Amen. And so it says, not by the one who sinned, Adam, his sin caused, caused guilt to everyone, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. One sin caused everyone to be condemned. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So while the one sin caused everybody to be guilty, the one gift offers everyone to be justified. And what does the word justification mean? Many people know. It's a declaration. What does it mean? It means God saying you're no longer guilty. That's an important thing for people to understand. Because 
we'll sit there and we'll lay in bed at night and we'll think about what we did yesterday or we'll think about what we did last week and we'll just kill ourselves in our own head and we'll say, I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. But if you've given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in his sacrifice, the Father says something different about you than what you're allowing the devil to whisper in your ear. What the Lord says about you is that you are righteous, not based on your performance, based on the performance of the, of the Holy One of Israel, Jesus, who never sinned, who never disobeyed, obeyed and offered up his sinless life as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sin. You. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Yeah. So what is it? Is it justification or is it righteousness? What, what is the gift? The gift is righteousness. The gift is justification. Because they mean the same thing. Righteousness is that you were guilty, but now you're not. And justification is that God says so. That's it. Amen. And it's a Amen. gift. Amen. And come, you that are thirsty, drink freely of the water of life. Amen. God's not charging nobody nothing because he sent his son. He paid the penalty. Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's what he said. I've sent him for a witness yeah. to declare to the people. He wants the people to know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He wants the declaration to go forth. He wants Israel in the Old Testament to be a light in the midst of darkness so that the people around them will know that I sent him to be a, to be a witness, to tell other nations, people that don't know him so that they can come to him. That's God's plan. Point number four in this passage of scripture. His word will not return empty. It will accomplish its purpose like rain. Amen. 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 He says, out of the word of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Israel was in a dry place spiritually in Isaiah. We talked about that. All the things that were going on. That was why I did all that in the front end. So you know, they were a mess. You ever been a mess in your life? Yes. You ever been dry spiritually before? Yes. Come on, somebody. Amen. Don't look at don't look at the preacher like he's crazy. Y'all know y'all been dry before. Yes. I've been dry. I've been dry. Right? Israel was in a dry place spiritually. Nevertheless, God's word prevails. His word is like rain or snow on dry, hardened ground. Most people that study anything about the land of Israel know that that land in Israel can if it, it, it depends on the rain. When we talked about the feast, we tried to explain all this, the former and the latter rains, if you've ever read about that, in the prophetic teachings of Joel and in other places, Israel depended on rain for their agriculture. Former rains came in a certain part of the year, latter rains came in another part of the year, but there were many times in Israel's history where they, would, they experienced drought. Drought resulted in famine. It's well known that if they don't get rain over there, the ground gets dry and cracked. But it's got a special blessing from the Lord. All it takes is one hit of rain. And the next morning when you wake up, stuff that the, the ground looked dead yesterday. And all of a sudden, life comes springing forth. Seed, wild seed that was laying in the ground comes to life. The same thing happens with God's word. You could be in a place spiritual. You could be dead, dry, barren, brittle, and, and no life able to be seen in the midst of you, in, in you. But all of a sudden, the word of the Lord hits you. Hallelujah. And like a rain or a snow that's so desperately needed, the next thing you know, life will begin to spring oh, forth. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that his word has life to it. I've been in some bad places in my life before I really knew the Lord. Some bad, dry, dark, dark places. I thank God that his word showed up. I thank God that his word watered that old dry, hardened ground. God said, my word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish its intended purpose. You know, God didn't have to create the plan the way that he did. What I mean is, he allows you and I to play. I mean, I don't mean to belittle it, what's really going on here, but I don't know how else to describe it. I used to love team sports. And I'm too old for that. So I like individual competition, but <laughs> team sports. God has allowed us to be part of his team. Amen. What I'm trying to say is he's already won. God already won. He did one word and he can wipe out Diablo. The devil's no match for, for God. He's a, the, the devil is a created being. 
God, through Calvary, destroyed the power of the enemy. Yes. 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 But yet at the same time, God allows us to live this life out. He's asking us to joint participate with him. The same way whenever you used to play on the football team or the same way if you were a girl and you were in dance. I don't know if you don't. Don't put your daughters in dance. That's just my opinion. Oh, Lord. God, I got so in trouble for you. It's because it's worldly. That's the only reason. Listen to the music that people playing. But anyway, that's between you and Jesus. I let Bella get in dance one year and took her out. She never went back. Why not, Daddy? You can't figure that one out? Did you hear the music that people were playing trying to get you to shake your booty up there and all that stuff and you ain't but six years old? No. That's the world. You may not agree with me. That's okay. Keep coming. You will before long. Amen. Okay. Point is, is this, is that God's looking for joint participation. Amen. He's wanting his people to work with him, to walk with him. He's allowing us to work with him and walk with him. He wants other nations and people groups to come. He wants them to hear the declaration of Messiah. He wants them in the midst of their darkness to see the light. Amen? God's plan is for the whole world. That they would all be saved. But what happens when his people are searching for water and bread that won't satisfy? What happens when his people aren't doing what they're supposed to do? He's already, the Assyrians have already taken the northern kingdom. Babylon's getting ready to come after the southern kingdom. God warns. There's always hope for God's people though. Amen? Amen. This is the transition point to the main point of my message. The title of my message is First Things First. The, in order for God's plan to work for the world, there are things that must first be taken care of by His people. Amen? I'm not saying that God can't bypass his people. I'm not saying that if Matt wants to be disobedient to the Lord, that he can't bypass Matt and find. God knows how to take one down and replace another one. He can do the same for you. If you're not wanting to walk with him, he just move you out the side. Well, let me put this one on the back burner for a while. And you know what? Hopefully when that water hits him and some light will start springing forward, we'll put him back in the game. But in the meantime, we'll just stick somebody else in there. Right? <laughs> We're going to go to Gideon, I'm sorry, to Judges chapter 6, but we won't start reading there yet. But I love the story of Gideon. I, I, once again, there's so much in both of these passages of Scripture that I had to be careful that I didn't overdo it. I'm just using Gideon as an illustration of first things first. Okay, of Again, God's people not being in the place that they need to be in order for God to properly use them. And I love the story of Gideon because I personally feel like you could say he was an underdog. The reason I say that is, is because, and I've, I know I've shared this with many of you before, if you have good memories, you might remember, but it says that whenever the angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon, where did he find him? Does anybody remember where he found Gideon? found him inside of a wine press, inside. threshing grain. Well, you're not supposed to thresh grain in a wine press, <laughs> because you need wind for that. Yeah. A wine press is like a vat. You put the grapes in there and you stomp the grapes in the wine press. And grain is supposed to be out on a big old open field where you run stone over it to break it up from the husks. You know, I've taught y'all about that before. That peanuts, that little skin on there. Grain has like a little skin and all that has to be separated. Then you throw it up in the air and you let the heavy grain falls down and the wind carries the chaff off. Okay, that's how you thresh grain. But Gideon is hiding in a wine press. Threshing grain. It means a couple of things. Number one, he's fear. He's full of fear. Because the enemy. That's why. But number two, he ain't got much. Because if he had a big harvest, he wouldn't be able to thresh it in a wine press to begin with. So he's hiding, and he's really got full of lack. All right? But what ends up happening is the angel of the Lord shows up, and he calls him a mighty man of valor. It's like, really? <laughs> I'm over here shaking in my shoes, hiding from the Midianites. But you know what? Don't you want to tell you something? God sees things in you and I that we can't yes. see. In Amen. 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 Praise, God. Praise God. And so what ends up taking place is, is that what God brings Gideon back to is he says, hey, I need you to offer me up a sacrifice. God brought Gideon back to the altar. Amen. And the word of God says right here in uh, the book of Judges, uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 24. We'll just read that one little verse real quick. It 
It says, Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abizarites. Now we preached this a few weeks back when I preached on the altar. This is one of the examples I used. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Amen. Now, when you find things going on in your life, all right, that aren't going the way that you would have expected them to go, then I need you to understand that you should always go back to the cross. You should always go back to the altar. Gideon's in fear. Gideon has lack. Gideon needs to go back to the altar. The Lord brings about why don't go back to the altar because Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says that this is where I died with Jesus and this is where I received my righteousness. This is where I received my declaration of justification was when I put faith in Christ. Amen. And because of that, it made my walk right with the Lord. Same way you received him, so shall you continue That's to right. walk in him, right. the book of Colossians says. Each and every day, if you want to be right with the Lord, your faith needs to be in the understanding that Jesus died for you. And, and because of that, a gift of righteousness was given to you. And because of your righteousness in the eyes of the Lord, you have access to the presence of God that will change you. Galatians 2.20 says this. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And now this life, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does that mean? It means when I put faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for me at the cross, in the mind of God, the old man that was born of Adam died. He was buried, and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. And there's been a change in God's mind. I'm no longer guilty. Now I'm righteous. And now each and every day, if I will learn to live my life that way by faith, this is the one thing that you need to be able to believe God for. If you can believe God for this, the faith resulting in righteousness, then you can go a long way with the Lord. Because the rest is on God. All your provision, all your needs, all the change to you, your family, your circumstances, all that is up to the Lord anyway. And so it says right here, though, but listen, when you find yourself in a situation like Gideon and the whole world around you is causing you trouble or the whole world's a big old mess, look at Galatians 6.14. Paul says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. If you're having a problem with the world around you like Israel was with the northern kingdoms, if you're having a problem with the world around you like Israel was with the Midianites and the Gideon story, <laughs> then what you need to remember is this, is that when you put your faith in Christ, not only did the old man die, hallelujah, to his old ways, but he also died to his connection to the world. That's another thing that you got to continue to believe God for. Amen? Amen? Gideon was in a situation where everything was falling apart. God brought it back to the altar. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. I don't know how many times i got to do this to prove it. I don't think I really have to prove it to you guys, but look at Galatians 1.20. How do you get peace? The altar. That's why I called it Jehovah Shalom. Look at Colossians 1.20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. God made peace between sinful man and his holiness through sending Jesus to die on the cross. You were used to be in enmity with God. You were his enemy. But now through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and your faith in that, you're now been reconciled unto God. But look at this. When you make peace with God, you go to war against the enemy. That's right. Amen. The first thing that God asked Gideon to do was to destroy Baal's presence in Gideon's life. This is where first things first come in. Praise Jesus. When you make peace with God, at the same time, you're going to a war against the devil. That's right. Now, one of the things that I need you to know based on this story is that there was something going on in Gideon's life that was really obvious. Yeah. It wasn't right. The thing that was going on in Gideon's life was real obvious. And, then, and listen, he wasn't the only one that was aware of it. Everybody was aware of it. It was affecting everybody's life. They're wondering why these Midianites keep showing up with camels more numerous than what you could count. And by the time they're done, there's not even any grass left on the ground. Come, now you tell me that ain't a messed up nation. Come all the way down there for harvest time just to steal all them people's stuff and then they go back home. And that's what was happening in Israel. 
But what the, after the Lord told Gideon, offer me up a sacrifice, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. Now, I've made peace with God. Then the Lord said, first things first, Gideon, there's something that you got to do. It says in uh, Judges chapter 6, verses 25 through 32. It came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take your father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the grove that is by it. Now, you got to understand that, th that this means that Gideon's daddy, Gideon was a, was a Hebrew, a Jewish man. He comes from the tribe of Manasseh. His, his people are Israelites. His daddy's got an altar to Baal in the front yard. And not only that, he's got this thing called a grove. And I can't really get into all the nitty gritty details of what a grove is, but it was shaped like something that's not holy. Because the way that they worshipped was through sexual occult practices. It kind of looked like the Washington Monument. That's where all that junk comes from. And it meant something. It had to do with sexual occult practices. And all this stuff is going on in Israel. It's real obvious. But everybody's so hardened to it that nobody makes a move. Everybody just acts like everything's fine. And they continue to live their life the way that they choose to live their life. But there's a problem going on. And God says, you've got to take care of the problem. Because not only is it in your life, it's at your daddy's house. And everybody is coming to y'all's house to worship this thing. It's time for us to do, to, to, to do first things first. We've got to make something right. The obvious things need to go. Right? He says right here, he says, and, and, and he says, the grove that is by it, and build an altar to the Lord. Your God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou hast cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared. He's still having a little bit of a fear issue. But listen, he's wanting to listen to the Lord. He felt a little bit of peace, boy, when he built that altar. Jehovah Shalom. Hallelujah. Woo, I can feel the peace of the Lord. Okay, now I need you to go tear your daddy's altar down. Oh, and now my knees start knocking again. He said, let me get 10 guys. We're going to do this at night. He couldn't do it by day, so he did it by night. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, I always imagine that they walked out. I preach this passage a lot. But I always imagine when they walked out, they could see the smoke rise. What is that burning over there? It's not time for the morning sacrifice yet. Even if you were pretending you served God and you were still doing God's sacrifices and Baal sacrifices, first sacrifice doesn't show up till, the, till 9 o'clock. What they doing? Burn? What's all that burning over there? Let's go check that out. Then they show up and they see what's taking place. And they're not too happy about it. It says right here, uh, and they said one another, who has done this thing? Oh, let, let's see here. I'm sorry. It says, uh, when the men woke up, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down. The grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered up upon the altar that was built. They tore down Baal's altar, cut that grove down, used it for wood, and took the second bullock that was, that was alive and offered it up as a sacrifice to the Lord. And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, because he has cast down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? So now Gideon's daddy all of a sudden is stepping up. He's like, yeah. my son just, look what he did. I think like a little, some paternal pride hit his heart. He's like, my boy turned his heart back to the Lord. He yes. tore down the altar that was in our front yard. And now everybody wants to kill him. I need to stand up for my boy. And he goes on to say, he says, uh, his altar, therefore on that day he called him Jerubal saying, let Baal plead against him. Essentially, his name means let Baal contend against him. In other words, if Baal is really God, then let Baal take up for himself. You don't have to kill my boy because he did this. God told, and what blows me away is, is that every day, everybody around knew that this was obviously not the Lord. If I could go through and explain to you time and again, now we've been doing it on Wednesday nights. How many times has God told his people, when I bring you to the new land, 
don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this, don't worship false gods, don't build, all, don't do all. He was so explicit, and they had that word right there, but yet here's this thing jutting up into the air, and all this occult practice going on. All this stuff is so obvious, but yet everybody's still going on. God's asking his people to do first things first. 